I wanted to pick a topic um, that I think is both interesting and uh, fun. And uh, so the idea is to give a brief introduction to the economics of superstars and also to my twist of it uh, to some extent. So let's start with a couple of facts with illustrations. So uh, the highest paid superstar singer in 1801 was opera singer Elizabeth Billington here on the left. So uh, she uh, worked at the opera houses in London and if she was hired by an opera house, they were guaranteed full houses all the time. And she was hired all the time. And uh, her wage at the time was 300 times the median earnings in London at the time. And this was considered quite uh, unbelievable, even scandalous by some people. So she was a superstar in the, in the modern sense. Uh, now last year, I just checked this from the uh, Forbes publishes this list every year. So last year, the highest paid singer uh, on this planet was Beyonce, there on the right, and she was making over $100 million, uh, which uh, interestingly is over 4,000 times the median wage in the US. And if you actually think that the right market here to think about is the world, you could say that she's making, um, you could quickly calculate that she's making about 100,000 times the median wage last year on Earth, okay? And so uh, clearly, there's some kind of a trend going on here. What's missing from this picture is, uh, is a prehistoric singer from some time past when people were living in caves, but I bet they were already singing. And uh, I don't have the exact figures for this, but I would guess that the order of magnitude would be about one times the median wage that the singers were earning at the time. So we can start to ask what's going on here uh, with this pattern. Okay. So uh, this was an introduction to superstar economics. There's a saying in economics that if you have some really basic idea, it's all in Marshall, which is this, was this famous textbook in uh, late 19th century. And indeed, this example about Elizabeth Billington was taken from uh, this old Marshall textbook, who used uh, the size of concert hall as an example of, a, of a superstar uh, technology. So what's a superstar economy? So when you have differences in talent between people, and you have a scaling technology by which the output of that talent can be produced for many, many consumers, then you have what we call a superstar technology, superstar economy. And before we get any kind of a wrong idea here, of course, I'm talking econ speak here. So when I say talent, I don't mean that the most talented singer would be the best if you make some acoustic measurements or something that this is, this is the best speaker, no. Uh, Talent in economics is this very cold definition that, look, if these other people are willing to give up something in order to get your product or service, and you have more of this something coming to you from other people than somebody else, then you are more talented, okay? So I, I would rule out, without actual measurements, I would rule out the claim that Beyonce is, is a 10 or 100 times more talented than Elizabeth Billington. There's no way to measure in this, uh, in this sense. But something has changed that relative to the uh, current typical earnings, the biggest superstar are making a lot more money now than they used. Okay, uh, so I claim what has changed is the technology and, and not the talent. So that's the definition of talent. So the definition of scale here, uh, in case of these uh, Billington and Beyonce, the scale is how many customers can you serve? So in the old days of living in caves, you could only serve those people who were within hearing distance huh? and who happened to live nearby. Now, in the age of Billington, concert halls had advanced acoustics already. There was no, uh, 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 there was no electronics involved. So people still had to hear your natural voice and you could only be in one place at the same time. And so she did that and the people who filled the concert hall, paid her for tickets, and she could earn a lot more relative to the typical wage than uh, the cave era singers. And now, in the era of electronics, you, know, you don't even have to be in the same place as your audience, okay? You don't even have to sing at the same time. Now, as much as Beyonce does sing uh, in live concerts, the transportation technology makes it much easier than in the days of Billington to tour the whole world and uh, serve many, many, many consumers at the same time. 
So this is where it's coming from. And so with technology like this, you can have small differences in this talent that translate to huge differences in income. So think about the consumers of um, singing services, for example. I'm simplifying a lot if I think, of course, there's many types of genres of music and, and so forth. But you can, you can only go to so many concerts. And if one singer, you think she's a little bit better than the next one, we, we could all go to the, and listen to the best one, right? So the scaling is very extreme here. If we have farmers producing different types of foods, we can, it's not so easy for us to let's just all consume the uh, farm output of this other farm. Okay? This, this scaling is not as obvious. We, we still need more farmers. But a smaller group of singers can serve all uh, consumers of this, uh, of this artistic product than in the old days. Okay? So one often hears talking to non-economists about this, uh, this type of lamenting. And it's fine to lament about things. But Gee, all these people who are doing trivial things like playing football or, or directing movies, why do they make so much money and not, not the people who are much more important like doctors and, and cooks and so forth? And I, I sympathize with this. But um, so the, this is just another example of what in economics is known as the diamond water paradox. Why are diamonds more expensive than water? There's no philosophical value involved there. But there's also no foul play necessarily. Okay? So the answer is not that, oh, these people are somehow uh, stealing your money. The technology happens to be such that in some industries, people who are best in that industry, in this very narrow sense of, of other people liking your product, they get a disproportionate share of the customers and of the revenues produced in that industry. Okay. Now, um, it's probably not very controversial to say that uh, entertainment is such an industry, we can talk about some other occupations. And actually, some occupations may be changing and becoming this type of superstar industries. OK, uh, okay so far, everything that I said is there's no problems there. This is the classic superstar economics, my take on it. Uh, and, uh, and, and you know, it's just great for consumers now. We don't have to listen to whoever happens to be the best singer in my small group. I can listen to the, my favorite singer in the whole wide world. Okay? What's the downside? Well, some people who would have wanted to be singers, maybe they don't get so much attention. Okay? Tough luck. Uh, and then there is this uh, somewhat disturbing feature that the highest incomes relative to the average income are growing faster than other incomes. So we can be worried about this for uh, or many of us are <coughs> worried about this for several reasons. <clears throat> Maybe just for aesthetic reasons or <clears throat> reasons worried that this will somehow affect other things outside the economy. So before I get to what actually might be a little bit wrong what's going on, there might be some problems here. Maybe not all is well after all. Okay? Before I get there, let's think about a little bit about this, where this thing is going. Because this technology is changing. Okay? So we could talk about superstar bias technological change. So it seems to be that all kinds of advances in different technologies, more often they're not, they're really driving and enforcing this development that the smaller group of people in many, many occupations are producing most and most of the customer value. Okay? Um, now, there is this big question way outside the study of superstars is that what kind of processes are causing the top incomes to become much more concentrated than before? Okay? Now, if we think that superstar economics can talk to this, then this is almost the same thing as saying that we have to define managers uh, of, at different, different levels as being part of this superstar technology. And the reason uh, is this, that there's a lot more. If you look at the top 1% or top fraction of a 1%, there's a lot more people who, according to statistics, are managers at some level, then there are entertainers, entertainers in, the, in the classical sense. Okay? So I'm going to make that case in a moment. But so let's think about this change in technology for a while. Why this thing has become a bigger deal and is probably still in the process of becoming an even bigger deal in the future. So one is the reduction in transport costs. Sometimes this is known as globalizations or the, or the outcomes um, caused by this. So 
in the case of these singers, it's easy now to tour the whole world. Whatever you're making, your product can now be shipped to the whole world. If you're the best at making something, the world is your market. Way back when your market was the local people that you could sort of carry your stuff in, in person, the, this put a certain bound to how much more the best people in, in, that star, in that industry can earn relative to the median. Okay. And so this, this gap has been growing and growing. Reduction in other communication costs, of course, if you think of moving information, this is now instant and very, very costless. Okay. If you produce information goods, like non-live music, now to serve everyone at very low cost, it, it's, it's trivially uh, cheap. Uh, Reductions in duplication costs, if you make some stuff more than before, thanks to technologies in, in manufacturing, it's easy to make many copies of it once you've made the prototype. So this has implications for designers of all kinds of things. So here are a couple of uh, examples of goods here. On the left, we have a violin made by Antonio Stradivari, who was a superstar designer of his age. He made less than 1,000 violins during his lifetime. There's very high demand for his violins up until this day, but it, it was done by hand. Okay, so this put a certain bound on how much more uh, the Stradivari family could earn relative to your average manufacturer in that era. Now, the other product I mentioned here is the iPhone, of which about half a billion have been sold so far. And of course, take the income of Steve Jobs or, or uh, the chief designer, Jonathan Aves, relative to your median wage. And again, you can see the superstar phenomenon is going on there. And all of these things are necessary. The reduction in transport costs, components are moved back and forth the world. You can find the best people in whatever component you need. Okay? It all magnifies each other. Uh, uh, duplication costs and so forth. Okay, so to this question about managers, what about these more mundane managers, so Steve Jobs, he was a superstar in some uh, colloquial sense as well, and not just technological sense. What about all these nameless mid-level managers who are working in different companies? Is this amenable to the superstar idea at all? So I think it is. Um, maybe it's not the whole story. Surely it's not the whole story. But all these technologies also make it possible to have larger companies than before, to have companies that operate globally instead of locally. So if you're the best in anything, even if you're not selling an entertainment product, again, this, this skewness, this uh, propensity for the uh, best in economic terms to get a larger share of the output, that, that's just being uh, emphasized. Now, uh, inside a company, that's also a little bit of a superstar technology in terms of the scaling. So think about a top manager. Whatever decisions they make, it sort of affects everyone in the company. So if you if I simplify it a little bit and say that people have 1%, it doesn't have to be big in absolute terms, so people have 1% impact on the output of whatever unit they're working with. So if you're the manager of a large company, the bigger the company, this 1% difference that you make relative to the next best person who could be there, that's worth humongous amounts of money. So the bigger the companies, caused by this technology makes possible bigger companies, the bigger is the actual economic impact of the top managers. And this spills over to lower levels as well. Then if you're just working with three people somewhere lower down the company, in some sense it's just as valuable as what you're doing, but if you mess something up, it will just affect those three people. Okay? So that's why, uh, again, the relative impact relative to the top, relative to the bottom, is just growing over time. Another uh, component that's going on here is that to have this superstar phenomena, people have to actually know who the top people are. Okay, either directly, I go to as a customer and buy some stuff from the entertainers, or through some firms who then know who the top producers are. Okay, but somehow someone has to know. Okay, and so in an opaque system where there's little information, not so much news going on all the time, the superstar phenomena would not be as, as strong. Okay, so when I mentioned Stradivari and iPhone, this is sort of the poster boy example. All is well again. Okay, this is wonderful for consumers. Now everybody gets the uh, fanciest design phones. Um, but, so now to the caveats. In what sense is not all well? So for this, we have to introduce something about this technology 
we have to take into account that often we have jobs where you actually don't know who the best talents are. Okay? It's very costly to find out who the best talents are. And once you start taking this into account, we get slightly different picture. I wouldn't say it overrides what I said before, but it introduces some important caveats here. If we think about, for example, whether all of this is going, uh, as we say in economics, whether all of this is efficient or could, could we do better by changing some policies. So what if what's not scarce is not talent, but our knowledge of it. So think of, for example, this management business. How do we know that somebody is good at managing a large company? Okay? There's no simple, we can't just make them take some exam and now we get a score and we say, okay, you're a really good manager. That's not how it works. In a way, the only way to really find out, we, we can reduce the set of people who could do it by making them go through tests, let them do an MBA, let them run a tiny company. But in the end, to run a major organization on several com uh, continents, that's a tough job. Okay. And we have to, maybe there's no other way, but to let these people to do this actual tough job for a while, and then we know whether they can do it. Some people can, some people can't. But you can't just create this type of job out of thin air. So then it can happen that, yeah, there's lots of people who could run these big companies very well. And there's lots of people also who could not. But there's only so many people who have ever had the chance to do this. Okay. So now you can start to calculate which one at the margin is really more scarce. The opportunities to reveal talent or the actual talent out there in the economy. And this has, so I can write the model, done it. Uh, so this has some implications for whether things are running efficiently or not. So in fact, if it's a problem that this opportunity is to reveal and it takes time to reveal who is good, if these are the scarce resource, then what you're going to observe in a market like this is everybody trying to hire someone who was already hired by someone else. So why does this happen? So this happens because people, unlike machines, are not some kind of a pledgeable asset that can be bought and sold. If you take your chance as one little part of this process in some industry, you think about, should we hire this new guy? We don't know how good he is. We don't know how good she is. Or should we go this person who is sort of okay? We know they have a track record. So at the margin, often from the point of view of the recruiter, it's entirely rational to sort of discount this new person because suppose they turn out to be wonderful. What happens? Well, everybody can see they're wonderful. Their wage, wage gets speeded up. What's in it for us? It's kind of safer to go with this so-and-so known talent. Now, in a market like this, you get what I would call sort of a mediocre manager merry-go-round. Okay? Everybody hires a good enough person, then they stick with it. The only saving grace here is that people have finite lifetimes. Okay? So sometimes somebody is forced to try somebody new. Okay? So what one can show that in a market like this, this process of discovering new talent uh, suffers what's known in economics as a tragedy of commons. So not enough of the stuff. <coughs> People aren't investing enough in something. Here that something is trying out new talent as opposed to sticking with the old so-and-so people. And so one can show that if this model is valid, then uh, relative to how well things could be, these known stars, well, they're going to be more scarce than they should be. They'll be earning more, possibly a lot more than they should be in an efficient market. Incomes are going to be a lot more skewed and the output is actually going to be lower than it could be. Okay? Um, so all is not necessarily well. And uh, to make this uh, come a bit close to home, let's think about one industry where I just picked this great quote at some point because it, uh, it sort of concerns us. So there's, uh, this is a, uh, there was a news story in New York Times quite a long time ago where they noticed that, okay, so now the average salary of university presidents just went above one million. Okay, so this happened like almost 10 years ago in the US. It's a very competitive market and uh, a professional recruiter was lamenting that, yeah, it's tough because every university tries to hire someone who already was a president somewhere else. Okay. To me, this is the smell test that, wow, that's probably a job where there's something specific. You have to be a president to know whether you can be a good president. You know, having been dean is not quite the same thing. You have to be a dean, but that's, that's not enough for us to know there's a final step. 
And it's probably that market. You know, maybe the average, the average president probably uh, is not as good as they could be. Okay? So the possibilities of, of new presidents to break in and show how good they are are, are too limited. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of, very briefly about a couple of cases. So this model is very tough to estimate in the sense that you can't you can just go out and look at some uh, data in about the uh, ordinary wage dynamics of people's careers and distinguish it from a competing model where the uncertainty is of the type that, oh yeah, we know how good you are on average. Of course, there's risk, you know, but we know how, that you're this good of a manager or movie director on average. And then, yeah, you get lucky or unlucky over time. Okay. What we'd need to empirically distinguish this is a major change in an institution that affects how efficient or inefficient this hiring is. Okay. So this, there are no great cases, but there's a couple of okay cases. So uh, my favorite case, because it also it really is about superstars, is the Hollywood studio system. So this took place uh, from the start of the modern movie industry uh, to about 1948. What made it special, what made it a little bit better in terms of this hiring problem um, than your average labor market is that uh, actors, people were actually able to commit to long-term wage contracts. Seven years, okay, it's not the lifetime, but it's pretty long. So what this means is that a lot of people wanted to work in this industry. Nobody knew who really is going to be a star. This was actually even a known, well-known saying, nobody knows, okay? Just make a couple of movies, then we know if the audience loves you. There's no other way. You can, maybe you rule out nine out of 10 people before this, but the last 10, you can't. There's just no other way. You gotta make a movie. It's expensive. Now, a lot of people wanted to do this. The studios were actually competing for these entry-level workers, but they were not paid much because there's so many, and we don't know who's good. So for seven years they work, and now, because their wage is committed for seven years, the studios had an incentive to keep trying new talent because, hey, if they find someone, then for seven years they get to keep them at a relatively low wage. Okay. So what happened? when the seven years was up. Well, then these studios, of course, started a bidding war and these people's wages went up a lot. Okay, so seven years, but it's something. So this system ended because um, the Supreme Court said that this seven-year contract is not enforceable. And so what happened, the data is not great from that period, what, what happened is definitely consistent with this inefficient hiring. So uh, wages uh, went up for the stars, even for those who were outside the seven-year system who in another model should have nothing to do with this restriction. What this is saying is that this artificial scarcity of uh, top talent became worse over time, okay? Companies started like, making less, uh, less money. What about the quality? Well, I don't directly observe that, but some movie buffs say that this Hollywood system was actually the golden age. I don't know about that, okay? Uh, now, other things happened as well, which makes it very tough empirically, you know, Soon afterwards, TV started to grow. You have all kinds of cohort effects and so forth. Professional team sports, we might get a great natural experiment any year now. There's always talk that EU might ban transfer fees, long-term wage contracts in sports. They're not that long, but still, they would, now the data is good. We could really observe this quite accurately. And as is often the case in economics, the most convincing evidence comes from some very narrow context, okay? We have to think about that a little bit creatively and generalize. So there's a, this is an example of superstar technology in itself. So a student at MIT uh, recently hired a thousand workers randomly. This is possible because there's an online job exchange called Odesk, where you hire people for tasks like computer programming, and then you grade them how well they did. So she went there, randomly picked a thousand workers without previous job experience, and gave them feedback on how good they were. And lo and behold, all these other people seeing that, hey, those people, actually many of them did well in their tasks, so they got more and more jobs this way. And you can show that the labor market there, it became more efficient as a result of this intervention, which is saying that it wasn't functioning efficiently enough. You, you had some kind of a mediocre program or merry-go-around going on there, people not wanting to try the untried on the employer side. Okay, so I'll conclude with some brief speculation, which I think is fine after you get tenure, now you can say whatever you want. Uh, so uh, I think in the future, more and more industries will face these superstar economy, economics, and teaching is one example. 
Okay, so these mass lectures, any kind of one-way lecture, this is, the technology is almost there. You know, if you're just sitting in a lecture, you might as well be sitting in some kind of 3D immersion and listening to the best lecturer in the world on that subject. Okay, so that, that's going to go the way of singing. What's going to remain is something like mentoring or small groups where there's true feedback between students and teachers. Okay, so I think that's our our best bet, and maybe to develop a few superstars in our, in our own uh, area. So in the big picture, there's more and more pressure towards even more skewed income distribution. The real problem for nation states, because if you try to tax people more heavily, then, well, the superstars, they're the most elastic. It's, for them, it's the most easy to move their business to another place, to move to Monaco. It's often the type of a job you can do anywhere. Okay? You have a high stake. So it's really hard. It's like a, exactly the people you'd want to tax the most are the ones that in some sense you'd want to tax the least from revenue perspective. So that's a real dilemma. And uh, we have another self-reinforcing process, I think, starting here is that even industries that don't have this original superstar technology, like a cook, you can only cook for so many people, it will start to reflect this superstar income distribution because now the very richest uh, we're already seeing this. They want to hire the very best cooks, the very best lawyers, unfortunately also the very best lobbyists. And this might put another gear into this self-reinforcing process. So I have one policy proposal as my last bullet point of the whole talk. Very uh, utopian, but uh, so in my model it would improve things and in, if I'm wrong then it wouldn't make any difference. So I think that's, on the other hand it's completely in, in feasible uh, sort of in political realism terms. So, so I call it the golden handcuffs contracts. So if there's industries where we suspect that actually talent is not that scarce, but the really scarce thing is the opportunities to reveal it, we should allow above some threshold of wage, let's say a million euros a year, we should allow truly binding long-term wage contracts. It's so like the studio system, okay? In the sense that of all these incoming managers, what you're really getting here is the chance to show how good you are. We say that, okay, for the next 20 years, you get this one million and no more. And if you quit, this is actually an enforceable contract. You can't, okay? Or if you, can, if you go somewhere else, the original company that took the chance on you will get your wage on top of the one million, okay? So this, would, this is a really rare case. I can tell you this is really rare in economics to come up with uh, an idea that's I think not completely ridiculous in terms of theory and empirics and would at the same time increase the size of the economy and decrease income inequality. Okay, it's really rare. Not realistic probably in practice, but that's what I'll end with. <laughs>